بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم There were many things I didn't understand right now. There were many things I didn't understand, some small little points, but uh, to learn the Quran, to be living near Mecca. I said Shahada about six months after I arrived here. But, uh, then I began to Dr. Saadi, he took me to Mecca. Immediately after saying Shahada, I got to see the Kaaba for the first time and I fell on my face. Okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'ina ma'bad. Everyone, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May Allah's peace and mercy and blessings be upon each single one of you. Welcome to today's show. I have a really special guest here. His name is Brother Samuel. Uh, Samuel, you can help us. Assalamu alaikum, brother. How are you? I'm doing very well. Anyone looking at you, they may be thinking that, yes, obviously you are a white, you are American, you don't have any accent, and you may be living somewhere in the USA. Where are you right now? Uh, I'm living about 40 minutes from Mecca in Inshallah. the city of Jeddah. In Jeddah. I live in a mosque here. So, brother... People may be thinking that, you know, a American living in Jeddah, uh, you know, white Christian, they may be thinking any person who is a white is a Christian. Tell mm -hmm. us, you know, I mean, mashallah, you converted to or reverted to Islam. Why would a person with the background of being a pastor, ordained pastor, white American brother, uh, brought up in the America with all the culture, with all the freedoms, why would you go there and recite la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah well dr sabila had no intention of ever coming to saudi arabia okay so i was involved in politics in washington i worked in human rights for 25 years with the u.s congress and i uh with the british and canadian parliaments also i organized members of parliament and congress to travel with me to meet with foreign heads of state on behalf of Christian, Jewish, Muslim prisoners of conscience in different countries. It was very successful. But after doing that human rights work for some 25 years before moving to Washington and in Washington, my wife and I moved to Annapolis, Maryland. And there I got involved. They asked me to, uh, I was a member of the Democratic Party. They asked me to be the head of the Democratic Party for the capital city in Maryland, Annapolis. So I worked with the Democratic Party for eight years. And then um, I was elected to the city council for Annapolis, Maryland. Then I ran for mayor. 
and I was so excited. My vision, my idea to be mayor of Annapolis and to be maybe even go on to be governor of Maryland. <laughs> or the president of the USA. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? My wife right? told me I should run for Congress. No. You see, man plans, but God is a better planner. Of course, of course. So and he's he sent me. I went into I, I was so involved in politics when I lost, I went into a deep depression. I lost the election. It was my fault. I got um, some friends invited me to downtown Annapolis. They started giving, I was heavy drinking alcohol. They put alcohol and they knew if I, they put it in front of me, I would pick it up and drink it. And I drank and drank and drank. Uh, they gave me about 15 shots of vodka and Coke. And from seven o'clock to 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, they said, hey, Sam, come outside. We have a, you need some fresh air. And I walked into hell. Uh, my life ended up on TV cameras. I was, uh, I didn't get elected to the city. To <laughs> as mayor, because that night was a catastrophe. It was May 14, 2009. And I walked out of there to headlines on newspapers and television. People talking about my drunken stupor and my very bad behavior. For two years, I sat in a horrible depression in, in and out of psychiatric counseling. And um, at the end of two years, I tried to get a job during this time I tried to get a job as a cashier at a service station. They said, no, you're, <laughs> you're too well educated. <laughs> you won't stay here. So then I tried to get a job at J.C. Penney's department store selling men's clothes. And they said, no, you're too old for this. So, but then walked into my life, Dr. Sapi Kaskas. He was a Muslim. So, so Brother Samuel, just one thing, right? You being an ordained pastor, is it okay for the pastors to drink? I mean, coming from uh, a Muslim it, perspective, let us know. No, it's uh, not the way I was drinking. Uh, and in some denominations, it's okay. But in I was brought up Southern Baptist, no alcohol, no smoking, this very strict. My mother, she would take me to the church every Sunday. And after the church service, she would take me to the library and there were children's books, a whole section of children's books. And one of the books that she got many times was called The God of Abraham, Ibrahim. And she would take me home and put, her on, put me on her lap and she'd say, Sammy, listen. And she would read the book to me and she would explain to me how Abraham left his mother and father because they were worshiping idols. And she said, Sammy, Listen very carefully. There's only one God. And you need to pray to that one God, the God of Abraham. Was your mother so, a Muslim? No. No, she was Christian. But that's what she believed. She she didn't talk about Trinity. She'd talk about Jesus. But she was always talking to me and to other people around her. Do you believe in the God of Abraham? Abraham. So when I went to high school at Bob Jones Academy, it's a very fundamentalist oh. Christian high school. Uh, while I was there, this is Dr. Sadiq Malki. How are you, my brother? Wa alaikum as salam. MashaAllah, good I to see you. I, I saw your meeting with that Catholic lady coming from Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the best you've done. Thank, Thank you. Allah. May Allah accept it from all of us. How are you, my brother? My name is Sadiq Malki. I'm a doctor from Washington University, St. Louis. We've been talking to you. Talking about so I'm from Chicago. I am from Mecca. I love Chicago. Alhamdulillah. Come on over anytime. MashaAllah. Both of you with your families. Allah, soon, Sam, get the first injection. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we're Allah. getting the... Uh, he had coronavirus. Very bad. I had. I, I went to the hospital five days. How are you, my brother? 
Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It's very cold in Chicago. Alhamdulillah. Another cat is Stephen. Allah Kareem. Alhamdulillah. See you. Assalamu alaikum alhamdulillah, brother. Um, where were we? Talking about my mother. Your mother, she brought a book. Yeah. And this book was a book written by a Muslim, right? Uh, no, it was written by a Christian, but the title was The God of Abraham. Okay. And my mother, she believed in uh, monotheism. She believed in the God of Abraham. She didn't talk about Jesus and Maryam and all of the other things that many Christians believe in. She told me, you have to believe in the God of Abraham. So that's the way I was raised. That's the way I was brought up. When I came here, I would ask, well, when I was in high school, I would ask my Bible teacher to, about the Trinity. Can you please explain the Trinity to me? And the teacher would say, well, it's like an egg. There's a shell, there's an egg white, and there's an egg yellow. And I would say, well, you mean God is like an egg? And he would say, no, 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 no. <laughs> so then I went to college. And I asked the college professor, I said, can you please explain the Trinity to me? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, he said, uh, it's like a banana. You peel it inside. If you squeeze it, there are three parts to the banana. I said, you mean God is like a banana? Oh, no, 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 no. So finally, I got to graduate school, Faith Theological Seminary, and I asked the theology teacher, please explain the Trinity to me. And he said, you can't explain it. It's a mystery. I well, see. that settled it for me. You know, I just continued in my faith in God as I was taught. Sure. Sorry. So, so despite despite your questioning of the Trinity, you still went to the seminary. <laughs> Correct. You still studied in the seminary, but you still had doubts about uh, the concept of yeah. God. I went there because I. That's true. And, um, but the more I grew, the more I believed and endured. And, uh, but then when God brought me here to, the, to Saudi Arabia, I began to understand as I read the Quran, I began to understand more and more and more and more. Now I've been here for nine years. I look back, uh, here I have my assistant, his name is Asa. I call him Jesus. <laughs> his mother and father are very good friends. They had six sons. And I said, Dr. Mohammed, six sons. I said, I have only one child. I have a daughter. I love her very much, but I've always wanted a son. I said, you got six, give me one of yours. And he said, take <laughs> Jesus. So Jesus travels with me. He just graduated from university here with a degree in Islamic studies. MashaAllah. So I'm, I have Jesus going with me everywhere. And uh, we have, we're a good team. We founded Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. And here um, we speak to Christian groups and Jewish groups all over the world about Islam. We talk to them about the six pillars of Islam, six pillars of faith, excuse faith, me, yeah. the six pillars of faith. And I have Jews and Christians sitting in front of me and I say, how many of you believe there's only one God? Everybody raises their hand. And I say, okay, how many of you believe in angels? Everybody raises their hand. How many of you believe in holy books? Let's say the Tanakh or the Old Testament or the New Testament, everybody raises their hand. How many of you believe in prophets? They start naming prophets mm -hmm. like my name is Samuel or Ibrahim or Musa. And uh, they all believe in prophets. They all raise their hands. And then I say, how many of you believe that someday every one of us is going to have to stand before God in a great judgment day? Where he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. How many of you believe this? Yeah. yeah. And he, um, everybody raises their hand. 
And then I say, how many of you believe that if God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen? Everybody raises their hand. And I said, those are the six pillars of faith of Islam. You know, we all we all have different beliefs. You know, there are many kinds of Jews. There are many kinds of Christians. There are Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, thousands of different kinds. And um, so there are different Muslim groups too. But all Muslims must believe in the six pillars of faith. And I say we have the five, six pillars of faith and then the five pillars of Islam. And I, we explain those later on in conversation. So, so Brother Samuel, if you can just go back a few more years, you, you mm -hmm. said you started to read the Quran. What made you to read the Quran? Well, I had to. When I came here, it was my responsibility to read this new American edition they were working on. They brought me here just as a pastor to read the work that they were working on. It was a new interpretation of the Quran in contemporary American English. Uh, Dr. Sadiq Malki was working on it. Dr. Safi Kaskas was the main translator or interpreter. And they just wanted me, Christian pastor, to read it. They wanted my impressions. And then I added footnotes at the, every, at the bottom of every page. Uh, whenever Ibrahim was mentioned, I showed where Ibrahim was mentioned in the Bible, where... Um, Arachman Elohim. These were two words that were very precious to me. And I said, um, uh, God, the most merciful, the distributor the, of mercy. I said, uh, this is incredible. I'm reading this. So you were reading the Quran. You were still a pastor. You were not yet a Muslim formally. I had never, I did not say Shahada. But when Dr. Sadiq took me, I, he led me in saying Shahada. MashaAllah. This was about six months after I arrived. And then he took me immediately to Mecca. And when I saw the Kaaba, because I knew already the Kaaba was restored by Ibrahim, uh, by Abraham and his son Ishmael. And I fell on my face and I was crying. Dr. Sadiq was standing behind me. And I remembered the words of my mother, you have to believe in the God of Ibrahim. You have to believe, Sammy. So uh, that's where it all started. So when, when you were reading the Quran, Brother Samuel, what kind of questions were coming to your mind? I know you had a biblical background and now you're reading the Quran just to have the proper translation or the correction to the translation. What was the spark as you were reading the Quran that made in you, in, that was talking to your heart and then you decided you know what this makes sense maybe this is the truth yeah. it's at the beginning of every surah or chapter arakman erohim it's at the beginning of every surah except for one mm -hmm. and when i began to study these words oh. because I had all of this sin in my life. You know, my mother told me, no drink, no smoking. But later in my life, I began to work in Russia. And the Russians, <laughs> they're very good drinkers. <laughs> and they tell you, you know, you have to drink with us. And I started drinking alcohol and smoking. And after I left Russia in 1997, I took that habit back to America with me. I like to smoke and every, the only, I didn't smoke at home, but I would go to the bar where everybody's sitting at the bar and I would drink and smoke. And my life just went into a tailspin. God uh, rescued me from that living by bringing me to Saudi Arabia and teaching me about Arachman Erohim. MashaAllah. You went to Russia to preach uh, Christianity or what was the reason? Because I heard your story that you got arrested because of the Bibles in Russia. What was that about? Yeah, I, yeah when after while I was in university and in graduate school, I started smuggling Bibles to Eastern Europe. Now I smuggle Qurans everywhere. <laughs> I'm a Quran smuggler. 
But Alhamdulillah. Um, I was arrested in the Soviet Union for smuggling Bibles. I was on my way to Moscow. I spent several days in jail because of that. And then I got arrested about a month later in Poland for smuggling Bibles there. Um, I was very well known as a Bible smuggler during those days. And this was uh, the 2000s or the 1990s? No, this was uh, 1971. I was arrested in the Soviet Union. Okay, okay. About 50 and, years ago. Uh, 1977, I married my interpreter in Czechoslovakia, Jana Luptakova. She's my wife. And then uh, Jana came to... She also converted the... to Islam? No, not yet. Not yet? Pray. Okay. Let's all pray for her, inshallah. May Allah give her the no, hidayah. but I... Her church, she's Catholic. Her church invites me to come and speak at the church when I go about Islam. So uh, good, my wife's name is Jenna. 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 And my daughter's name is Jenna. And if you look at the church, I wish I could put a picture of the church up on the screen. If you look directly at the church, it's designed the front of the church to look like Allah. And uh, <laughs> I call it the Allah. Allah Catholic Church. I think the architect must have been from Syria or one of the Middle East countries. Like he must be, you know, he was Catholic, but he designed the Catholic used the word Allah too. So he designed the church with the word Allah into the church. Who knows? There's Allah you know, plan, you know. Yeah, my daughter's studying Quran now. Mashallah. She's studying life of Prophet Muhammad, inshallah. Inshallah, you know, all we can do is we can convey the message the way that the Prophet did. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You know, as the Quran says in Surah 16, Ayah number 125, That invite all to the way of Allah with wisdom and good preaching and converse yeah. with them in ways which are best and most gracious. So Alhamdulillah, continue the wonderful conveying of Islam to your family, obviously, and then to all of humanity. And then we have to pray to Allah for guidance to come to our fellow brothers and sisters of humanity. I want Dr. Sadiq to sit in, sit here with me for a minute. Yeah, yeah. Assalamu alaikum, my brother. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam. Come on over, brother. You can sit there. Uh, yeah. I don't want to bother you. You know, you're coming. Uh, but it's, it's, it's the journey. I, I watched many of your programs. Okay. And, uh, you know, we, when, when Sam was telling me, you know, he said, I, I said the Shahada, I said, did you go to Mecca? I'm using always Mecca as a threshold. You know, I meet an American lady last time, I, about uh, eight years ago. And, uh, uh, and she, I said, uh, do you believe in one God? She said, of course, I believe in God, one God. And I said, is Muhammad is one of his prophets, isn't he? Allah <laughs> salatu wassalam. She said, I actually teach my students in America that Muhammad is a prophet of God. Brother, I just wanted to show you my book because it might help you in your argumentation. And I'm, I know you are beyond me, but this is a book I wrote with a Christian priest. Okay, okay. He's from Yale University. The book called The Globalization of Faith. Sam will send it to you, a copy, an electronic copy to you. It's now nine languages. The book is, is in five languages here. The logic is very simple. It says if God is a man, then women will be very upset. Exactly. If God is three, then you have broken the rule of the first commandment. God is multi, God is one. So the minute you break him into three, then he could be seven. Why he's not 20? Why he's not a thousand in the Hindu religion or whatever? So the minute you stop, if God is a Palestinian, then people from Holland will feel bad. If God is my color, then blonde people or black people will find it difficult to believe in him. So the minute the book is called Reductionism and the Globalization of Faith. If, so if God is 33 years of age, older people may feel discriminated. And right? the young ones. And the young out. ones. Because one last thing, brother, when people are visiting you in the mosque, one of the simplest da'wah tools is actually what do, what do Muslims say in their prayer? What does the caller to prayer say? I have it in an O4 page. Sam will send it to you. And below, I would use verses that would be relevant. And this is what do what do Muslims say in their prayer on the same page? Okay. So because 
you're using the the the, the disenchantment, the, the questioning in the mind of the individual. What this man who is saying, Allah, what he's saying. So we use that kind of uh, eagerness to, to provide a tool. And then the second thing, I'm using the khutbah because Prophet Muhammad told us of all his alayhi salatu wasalam, of all his hadith, he told us to deliver last this last sermon. So I will send it to you both electronically. I know you will make it better so that, and the book will be sent also electronically. But now I have to leave you with Sam. My brother, brother Sam Muhammad. has my has my telephone number. You can send it, you can WhatsApp me, inshallah, those. Allah Kareem. Thank you, sir. And is your, book, you, is your book on Amazon? Uh, it's on Amazon Kindle. Okay, so you can text okay, me the name of the better. book. Yes, it says Reductionism and the Globalization of Faith. But it's okay. better I send it to you because now it is in Korean, in Turkish, in Russian. So it, it all will come to you. MashaAllah. May Allah bless you, brother, for your long. work. And in the, in the middle of the book, we said if God is not a man, is not this, is not this, then we discover that in all of the Holy Scripture, he is always one. Here, O Israel, the first of all commandments, the Lord our God is one Lord. And I found it in From Hinduism and also in Native American. So the, the book is very short, about uh, about 24 A4 pages. So it's not a book, it's, it's a, a research. I mean, Don't forget this, what does the caller to prayer say? Huh? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. So, mashallah, brother Samuel, looks like you have really good uh, brothers and friends around you. Yeah. Um, you have a really good team. May Allah bless your team. So, you were saying something about about uh, the the work that you're doing right now, mashallah. Not only you have converted or reverted to Islam, you have this organization and you have some vision. Please tell us about that. Uh. It's called Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. That's, we do interfaith work all over the world, talking to people about the six pillars of faith. And then during this time, I'm also talking to people about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Peace be upon him. Uh, we've had a number of trips to Havana, Cuba. And in Cuba, we have, uh, we held a big dinner in Havana. We invited communist leaders. We invited the president of Cuba. Uh, we invited, he didn't come, but he sent the 10 top communist leaders. We invited the Russian Orthodox priests, the Catholic priests. They brought members of their congregations. And then we invited, of course, Muslims. And the head of the Jewish community in Havana came with about 15 Jews. And I had a plan to talk to them and I'm standing in front of about 150 people and I'm thinking about Medina. Yes, yes. And I'm telling him, I said, our prophet Muhammad, who is he? When he migrated to Medina, he entered the city, he was welcomed by all the people of Medina. And he dictated the Medina Declaration, which guaranteed freedom for Jews and Christians and Muslims and even atheists, <laughs> the communist. He loved you. And if, if he were here tonight, he would let you know that he loves and appreciates each one of you. And he would share his faith with you. So I want to thank you for being here with us in Havana tonight. And my speaker was, my interpreter was Jewish lady. And she said, please stop, stop. I said, yes, what's wrong? We had to give her a box of Kleenex. She was crying so hard. She said, I never knew that Muhammad loved me. Peace be upon him. So there's so many things we can do in the world today to let people know the true meaning of Islam. I meet Muslim youth all over the world now, in Norway recently, in Oslo, different places, in Germany, in, in Belgium, England. Many of the Muslim youth are on the street, they're doing drugs, they're smoking alcohol, they were born Muslim, but they need help to come back to the straight path. I walked in a bar in Frankfurt, I'm walking down the street, I see obviously some Muslims standing outside, they looked like they were from Somalia. And I walked inside and there were 10 men sitting at the bar consuming alcohol. And I said, 
Mohammed, and three of them turned around. <laughs> yeah, very sad, very sad. Uh... We need to reach these kids and bring them back. So we have two forms of dawah, one to non-believers, and the second one to those who were born Muslim to bring them back in, in the faith. And the way of doing this is to encourage them. They, they're so ashamed of being Muslim because of what they see on TV. They began to believe some of these things and they need to understand uh, Islam is beautiful, Islam is good. Islam is animal rights, activism, <laughs> prophet. He taught animal rights. I was an environmentalist activist in Annapolis. And when I came here and I read in the Quran and I read in the Hadith that Prophet Muhammad, he loved plants, he loved animals. He was anti-war. You couldn't kill anybody. And if you were defending yourself, you couldn't kill innocent people. You couldn't kill women. You couldn't kill uh, children. You couldn't kill elderly. You couldn't destroy a Christian church if you were a Muslim and you couldn't destroy a, a Jewish a synagogue or any other religious building. This was not permitted. So I took a group to Japan. We went to Hiroshima. I had a group of Muslim young people with me and we found ground zero where the atomic bomb was dropped. It killed 130,000 people over several months from the radioactivity, 60,000 immediately and another 70,000 over the next six months. And, um, it destroyed churches. It destroyed all kinds of religious buildings, destroyed mosques. He said, this is anti, we bowed and prayed at ground zero that we must get rid of nuclear weapons. We asked Allah to help us do this. Any weapons of mass destruction that kill innocent people, they're not permitted in Islam. When you explain that to Muslim youth today, they don't even, most of them don't understand. We're peace activists. The prophet was a great peace activist. So there's so much that we can do today in modern society to help our young people to be proud of Islam. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. Because, you know, education, they lack that education, unfortunately. And they may be yeah. believing in the media or they may have, you know, peer pressure, social pressure, cultural pressure. So we as Muslims, mashallah, right? We need to make sure that not only we keep on educating ourselves, practice, practicing Islam on ourselves, we also need to reach out to our own people, especially the youth. And obviously we need to do the da'wah to our non-Muslim brothers and sisters. So what would you say, Brother Samuel, to those Christian brothers and sisters who are still believing in Trinity, taking Jesus to be God, son of God divine, how would you enlighten them? Well, the, um, it, it's just actually common sense. If you look at the different church councils that took place, beginning with the Council of Nicaea, mm -hmm. you understand what happened in each one. Council of Nicaea, when they decided which books would be in the Bible. And they still haven't got it all figured out because uh, the Orthodox believe in a certain number of books more than Catholics, and the Catholics believe in more books than the Protestants, uh, they still haven't decided. So, uh, but some of that was settled at the Council of Nicaea, and then the Trinity was decided at the Council of Nicaea, and then they started. But I mean, even in the Bible, you ask Christians today, how is the Holy Spirit a part of the Trinity? And they give you a passage of scripture that isn't even in the oldest known copy of the Bible. So you, through textual criticism, uh, you can understand there are, I was taught in fundamentalist Christian college and fundamentalist Christian seminaries, three of them. I was taught that the Bible has mistakes in it. Of course, I'd say there's no major mistakes, but uh, it does. And we have to think with open mind and when we begin, begin to think logically. So it's our responsibility, mashallah, and you're doing it very good. May Allah reward you for it, brother. 
And, and what would you say, Brother Samuel, to those non-Muslims, brothers and sisters, because of lack of education, because of Fox News and whatnot, they may have major misconceptions about Islam. How would you educate those individuals? I would just say that I was very much like them when I was living in the United States. Now I live in the center of Islam. I live in the Mecca province, just down the road from the Kaaba. And here, you know, when I came here, I was afraid because of everything I heard about Islam in America. The students from the United States Naval Academy, many of them were my friends. They came to me and they said, don't go, don't go, don't go. And they were showing me videos of, of people being decapitated by Muslims, by so-called Muslims, by Al-Qaeda and other groups. Uh, when I got here, I was afraid when I got off the plane. After a few days, I said to Dr. Safi, I said, uh, I had a, one of his offices was used for my apartment. And I said, I need to go to the supermarket. Can your driver take me to the supermarket? He said, my driver's off today. But he took me to the window and he pointed. He said, right down the street there, look, you see that tall building? That's a supermarket. You can go there. You can walk. And I said, but... <laughs> I said, won't somebody kidnap me or, or cut my throat? <laughs> he laughed and he said, you're going to get hungry. Start walking. So I got out on the sidewalk and I started walking toward the supermarket. Every time somebody passed me, I would look over my shoulder to make sure they didn't have a <laughs> <laughs> That must be an and awkward got, feeling for you. Yeah, when I got to the supermarket, I think I was the only white American type in the supermarket. People would come up to me and they would say, where are you from? And I would say, I'm from North, North America. <laughs> I would say United States. And they say, you're from Canada or the United States? And I said, I'm from, uh, I'm from Washington, DC. South of Canada. <laughs> yeah, South of Canada. <laughs> and then, you know what? They would say, Alan Wasalan, welcome to Saudi Arabia. And they reach out and hug me. MashaAllah. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. It was the love of the Muslims here that brought me to Islam. MashaAllah. If you asked me 10 years ago when I was running for mayor of Annapolis and hoping to be the governor of Maryland someday, if you told me then you're not going to be elected to office, I'm sending you to the deserts of Saudi Arabia. You're going to be a Muslim. You're going to be living in a mosque and you're going to have a son named Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you would be laughing. <laughs> it's the most incredible story in the world. I'm yeah. so grateful to Allah. I'm so grateful. But Samuel, I think it was Allah's plan. So you'd lose the election because he was yeah. he something better for you. In, just yeah. imagine if you would have won the election, your life would be just, you know, what we see out there now in the media, this Capitol Hill, you know, insertion and whatnot. Yeah. So God, God blessed you, mashallah. You know, I'm so, uh, it's just a priceless gift that Allah has given to you. Yeah. And here, there are no liquor stores, <laughs> no alcohol. Alhamdulillah. I came here, I was on all kinds of anti- uh, Depressant. Depression medicines. And when I ran out, I didn't know what to do. I was afraid to tell Dr. Safi I was taking these medications, but I ran out and I, I, I didn't need them anymore. Alhamdulillah. Allah is the best of healers. Quran is the best solution. You don't need anything else, right? Alhamdulillah, besides Sorry. Allah. Islam's guidance. So brother Samuel, you know, mashallah, your story is, um, you know, is, is so unique that anyone who may be hearing it, watching this video, watching your YouTube videos, we cannot hold back our emotions, our, you know, our tears. And I hope and pray that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make many more people see the light of Islam through your story, through your activism, through the wonderful team that you have. 
So mashallah, keep up with that. I have one important question for you, Brother Samuel. I mean, obviously you were brought up in the USA with American I'm friends. Sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I get very emotional when I talk about this story because uh, my whole life was turned upside down. Alhamdulillah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, Alhamdulillah. What was the reaction from your, from your friends, from your, from your relatives, from your family members? Because oh. I, for this is something so new to them, they could not even imagine. How can <laughs> an American become, adopt the religion of, you know, quote unquote, the Arabs? So what was the I, reaction? Uh, they didn't know quite what to do. They were very upset at first, especially when I started telling, announcing on TV and other places that I am now a Muslim. And uh, I said, uh, I, God brought me here. He changed my life. And uh, my brother had lots of questions. He lived in Tennessee. He was my only living member of my immediate family. So Asa and I and two other brothers who went to the United States, we went to Tennessee to meet with my brother in Loudoun, Tennessee, outside Knoxville. My brother was scared. He didn't know quite what to think. But after talking to us for about three hours, we had dinner at a restaurant. He said, come and stay at my home. He had a RV, recreation vehicle, sitting in the driveway. So three brothers slept there, and I slept in the house with my brother and sister-in-law. They had an extra bedroom. And uh, the next morning, Asa came to where I was in the house. We were getting ready for breakfast. And he walked in the bedroom, and there was a chart. Uh, there was something framed. It was bullets a picture of bullets, and it said these bullets have been soaked in pig's grease to be used on Muslims. <laughs> so that they'll go directly to hell. <laughs> and Jesus was scared. He didn't know what to think. <laughs> and then we had breakfast. You mean Jesus, After your breakfast. son? Yeah. Okay, that's After sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Asa, Jesus. I call him my son. My and God. then uh, we went out on the patio and behind the house and we were having breakfast. And then my brother said, I thought you pray every five times a day. He said, you haven't prayed. And Asa said, no, we prayed in the RV. But he said, uh, I want to watch you pray. He wanted to make a video of us praying. So I stood with the other three brothers and we prayed on the back porch. And my brother began to cry. MashaAllah. He didn't know that Muslims were good. He was always afraid for me living here in Saudi Arabia. When he met Asa, when he met the other uh, three brothers, he understood. Uh, his heart was open. And Asa and I explained to him the five pillars of Islam. He didn't say Shahada at that time, but he did later. MashaAllah, uh, Allahu Akbar. I'm very grateful that I had this opportunity to be with him. He passed away about a month ago. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. We uh, pray for my sister-in-law, Judy. She's still asking questions and she's very happy. I stay in close contact with her. She's in, my brother was 83. He was much older than I, or 10 years older. But um, I don't know. It's just a miracle to see everything that God has done. And we hope that Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation will be continue to be used to God that no, Allah will be able, he'll be able to use us in reaching out and through our behavior that many, many people. I believe there are probably 80 million Americans who were taught when they're children that there is only one God. 
but they don't understand Islam. So if we can bring them to Islam and they can understand Allah through Islam, then their lives will be changed. But it's through our behavior that this is going to happen. It's through the love that we show for our neighbors. It's through our actions that Allah will be able to bring others to Islam. Exactly. You know, that's what I always say, that those, our fellow Americans, our fellow humans, if they have misconceptions about Islam, perhaps we have not done our job. No. So I, I cannot just blame them because of what they are saying and doing and believing. I have to do my job, then pray to Allah, then leave it at, you know, if no, they accept no. or not. No. But, but you have a really good lesson, mashallah. Your brother just watched you pray and he saw the change and the, and, and the transformation that Islam has uh, given to you. And that but his neighbor, you think. His next door neighbor saw what was going on, that we were praying. And he would call my brother on his cell phone. He said, Lou, there are a bunch of Muslims on your back porch. <laughs> I got my, you want me to bring my gun? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my brother said, no, these are good people. If more people knew about that, Brother Samuel, you know, we need more people like you. May Allah bless the work that you're doing. And this is a good message also when people watch this video and watch you, mashallah, that a white American brought up in a Christian culture, uh, parents are, you know, Christians, and now converting or reverting to Islam, they should know and, and the perceptions may change that no, Islam is not only for the Arabs or only for the Indian, Pakistani, Africans. Islam is a universal faith. Islam is for all of humanity. Only one faith that Allah has given to all the humans, all the prophets. And that faith is submission to the creator, which in Arabic is Islam. So may Allah keep on blessing your work and give you strength, give you protection, give you the hikmah, the ability, keep on blessing you and honoring you and all of us. So all of us, Brother Samuel, that we become peace ambassadors of Islam to humanity. So go ahead, what are the last words of wisdom that you have for the viewers, both Muslims and non-Muslim brothers and sisters? Um, I think we live in very difficult times. Look, all around us. We, we read in the Bible, it, the disciples asked Jesus, when will you return? He told them he would come back. And he said, only God knows. This is another evidence that Jesus wasn't God. <laughs> he says, only God knows. Father in heaven, he knows, not me. So we need to to mimic the behavior of the prophets. Jesus said, uh, honor your neighbors and do for your neighbors what you want them to do for you. And the prophet Muhammad said, don't do to your neighbors what you don't want done to you. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. they were, all the prophets had the same message. So I think if there's any message today, the world's in a mess. We live in a world where wrong seems right. And there's temptation pulling us in every direction. And we need to stay close to Allah. It's easy to be led off, led astray, off the straight path. And we need to help one another to stay on the path. And we need to look for those who are off the path, who were on the path, but off now, bring them back. And we need to look to those who know nothing about the path and give them, share with them the good news that Amen. Allah loves them and wants them to come to faith. Especially Brother Samuel, we need to pray for a man in Washington. He really needs our help. Yeah. And speaking about uh, Mr. Trump. Yeah. He's looking for we peace, he's looking for, for solutions and all of his followers, you know, they, they, they need guidance. They need that yeah. peace, that contentment in their hearts and minds. Yes, we need to blame them for what happened, but we also need to see, you know, what have we done? Have we educated them? Have we showed them a better way, the right way, no. the best guidance? So let's no. pray for you know President Trump. May Allah guide no. him. May Allah show him uh, the path of Islam, all of his followers, and yes, to all of humanity. No. So again, Amen. Jazakallah khairan, Brother Amen. Samuel, for your time. I know it's pretty late for you in Mecca. Please do dua for me, my family, for all of humanity. Okay. Jazakallah Thank you, brother.
Thank you for letting me be with you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. In the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. قل هو الله أحد. Say, He is Allah, who is one. الله الصمد. Allah, the eternal refuge. لم يلد ولم يولد. He neither begets nor is born. Nor is there to him any equivalent. <laughs>